tell you why I have it. Gus Nichols, which you remember we used to have Gus Nichols workshops out at Gus Coast Bible Camp in the summertime. Month of August. He used to be out there with us for a week. And in one of those sessions out there, he recommended that book. Wow. And it's just a biblical analysis. And it analyzes starting with from the book, from the Bible. It's, it's a, and uh, it doesn't mean that you will agree with all of it. Sure. But, but this man is either a member of the Church of Christ or a very conservative Christian church. I, 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 because I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. What's his name? How do you spell his last name? Straub, I think. S T R A B B. S T R A B B. But it was highly recommended by uh, the Gospel Advocate and uh, several brethren in our brotherhood that we'd have confidence in. You know. Brother David Sargent is here. <laughs> that is a good thing. Did you, uh, was it on Amazon? Or? I swear I saw it, darling. Okay, I'm, I'm with your Christian book. Let me check Amazon here. Yeah. <coughs> I bet I find it. Walter Lewis Strong. S-T-R-A-U-B? Yeah. You find it? Strong. S-T-R-U-B. William Lewis. Yeah. I mean, they got available copies. It says in stock, 1149. Let's see. Three of books. It's just a good research book to have, you know, it's a sermon out there. One left. That's why that's not good. One left. <laughs> Lewis. Strong, S-T-R-O-B-B. S-T-R-A. You ought to get him the R at the right now. U-B. Okay. You ought to order it right now. Yes, we're going to do it. Can you order it for him? Pay it for us. You have to pay you for him. You have to order it. One of the elders ought to buy that for you, Tom. Amen. S-T-R-A-B, right? Isn't it? Strong. It's U-B, isn't it? U B S T R A U B U B straw. So that announcement for this biblical analysis. And it took me about two weeks to find it in my office. And guess well, where I found it? Where? Right where I put it. <laughs> <laughs> Down on the bottom shelf. Well, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little story. When I got sick at Faulkner and kind of had Parkinson, didn't it, wasn't in my right mind. I left Father, and after about a year, I wouldn't communicate him. But uh, Scott Gleaves said I hadn't heard from him, so he opened my office and let the Bible majors just come in and take the books, my books. Well, I'm back in my right mind, but I don't have my books. Now, I've got quite a few books that brought with me, but. Some real valuable books. There's some down in our conference room that are free. You ought to see if there's any down there that could be a benefit to you. Well, yes, sir. We had a youth minister that quit ministry and left some in his office. And uh, you're welcome to look at them, too. Yes, sir. I'd be glad to. I'm having this fellow here. Yeah, that, glad to. I think it's past time to start on five after time starts, but we'll go ahead and begin. We got a lot to do today. I, I've got more stuff. I've got stuff under here that y'all, I don't think we'll even get to today. But, uh, uh, right with you, we want to have a song. After the song, uh, I'm, going to ask uh, uh, David, you had, we're going to punish you for not being here last time. If I have the name said prayers. Do any of you have anybody in particular that you'd like for David to remember in prayer? There's a... I wish I could... 
here at ATR or OEM here. Did y'all hear about the girl who went up to the that died so you know? Yeah. Anything else, please keep that baby with her. Mother in law. I was going to kill our daughter and maybe my grandson. <clears throat> in there, God, of gifts of the, gifts, plural of the Spirit, versus gift of the Spirit. Right. It looks at it analytically. Yeah. And it, I don't see how you can argue with it. That's great. So, that's just, that's just about P90 piece of what's in there. Yeah. And what's the man's name, the writer? William Lewis, William Lewis Straw. It's, it, it's called Biblical Analysis, David. And, S T R A U B, and uh, I've only been able to find one copy, but it just was bought. But well, Amazon may have one. I had mine laying out on a table, and my wife cleaned off the table, and I hadn't found that book yet. <laughs> and I don't whether I looked where I thought she might have put it, but I couldn't find it there. But but, but I'll I will find. It. Yeah, I gotta go another. Took me two weeks to find it. Ray, let's sing and then David's gonna pray for us. Onward rejoicing, I tread life's way. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. that 
uh, have struggles, Father, we pray for each one of those. And, and Father, that you will bless each one as you see their need. Amen. So, Father, again, thank you for this opportunity for us to be together to share and study your word. Bless us today and uh, help us always to live for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And getting ready for today, I, I began to go through my files, pull out some things that I've done in time past, and I found one I thought I'd never see again. I didn't know where it was, but I ran on it. And uh, I prepared this when I was in my 20s. And uh, I had read a paper by the late, uh, I assume he was the late, Virgil Trout. And uh, he used to edit a magazine, or a little magazine called Anchor. And it was an article in there. From that, I developed this outline. And it's ugly. It's got, I, I, I typed it on a, a manual Underwood, it had one of those long carriages on it like so. So take that into account, and can you mind giving everybody a copy? Yeah. We made 12 copies of everything. We could only let one other person come in. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the text. Well, someone else, uh, Stephen turned to 1 Samuel chapter 4, and I'm going to, we want to read more than verse 21 and 22. So we want to go back to verse 12. Verse, no, verse 11. Verse 11. Begin with verse 11. Begin with verse 11 and read down through verse 22. And I know that's a long reading, but it puts it, puts it into uh, the background of what we want to talk about. Also, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phineas, died. Then a man, Benjamin, ran from the battle line the same day and came to shot up with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now, when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled in the ark of God. And when the men, man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of the stillness mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said, Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Then it happened, when he had mentioned of the ark of God, that Eli fell off the sea backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter, daughter Phineas's wife, was with child, due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have born a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God had been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. Okay, I'll, I just want to go over this outline with you. I had a time this when the glory of God departs. And in this case, and I've, I've studied what the glory of God means, and, and it can mean God's uh, blessings, it, 
that he stows upon us, it can mean his presence. Uh, his, uh, that, that, if you, I looked at it from the Hebrew and the Greek, and we remember the fall of sin and come short of what? Glory. Glory of God. So, and we do all things to the glory, glory of God. The Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines. The sons of Eli were slain, and that news reached Eli. He falls over, breaks his neck. And then his daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law learns of her husband's death, Eli's death. That the, she learns that the Ark of the Covenant is taken, and that her and and so she brings the well, this She has her son in premature labor, and she died in childbirth. She called him Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. And I think that happened to King Saul. The glory of God departed from Saul. Uh, but the glory of God can depart from a nation. Uh, it departed from Israel. There, there are still, uh, these are some points that I made in this lesson that when I was in my 20s. Keep, keep some of that in mind. There is still a ruling and overruling power behind the nations of the world. Amen. And I think that's made plain through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18 is also by Daniel. In uh, Daniel uh, five, 4 and 5, I think it is, best I recall. There is no hope for a nation when the glory of God departs. That's what Psalm 9, 917 tells us. We could be, be turning to hell all nations that forget God. It is God who favors and, and protects the entire nations of people. Blessed is the nation that is whose God is the Lord, okay? The nation which God blesses is the one that is righteous. Righteousness exalts the nation. And it takes righteousness to save a nation. Look, study Proverbs 28 and 2. Uh, take a candid look at what happened to the unrighteous. For example, the world became so wicked during the days of Noah that the glory of God departed. God said, the end of all flesh has come up before me. And it grieved God that it even made man. We, we know how he saved Noah and his family. The ancient city of Sodom became so evil that God departed it, destroyed it with fire and brimstone. Uh, God would have spared the city if what could have been found, righteousness had been found. But because of the sin of Sodom, was grievous the glory of God departing from Sodom. Because the people became so corrupt, God sent ancient, ancient Israel into captivity. And God's glory departed from his people, but not without promise. And Don will talk to us about that next month. About him coming back. And God promised Brown, I'm, I'm assuming that's part of it. We'll talk about. Well, what about our nation? Will God always bless America? Our nation... You would think I wrote this, this yesterday. Mm -hmm. Will God always bless our nation? Our nation was founded upon the firm conviction that there is a God in heaven to worship and serve. When a nation ceases to look to God, the glory of God departs from that nation. And the past is filled with the graves of empires that fell because the glory of God departed. There's Rome and Carthage and Babylon. Uh, you could write Ichabod on the tombstone of those nations. And when a nation ceases to be good, what was the man said? It ceases to be what? Great. Great. When it ceases to be good, it ceases to be great. That's when the glory of God will depart. Will God always strive with a nation like ours? Well, back then we'd have over a million divorces every year. I don't know. You could find out today what it was. That's pretty, that's pretty up to date. That's relevant. A nation that has a high rate of unemployment not because men can't work, because in many instances they won't work, but lest they lose their free bread. That's why I see you think I wrote it yesterday. Exactly. A nation that every few years sacrifices the young men on the bloody altar of war. Is he going to bless a nation like it? A nation that thrills at the sight of blood in the athletic arena. Brother Furman Curley was one, one of my teachers when I was an old Alabama Christian. Furman was a scholar. Later went on to teach out in Abilene and was the editor of the Advocate. 
But he said that the, modern, the athletic games are <coughs> nothing more than like the Roman games in the Colosseum. They're just modern, like the modern games. The meaner they can get, the harder they can hit, the better the people in the crowd seem to like it. Our religious convictions have become so cold and meaningless. A nation where every sin in the catalog of sins is committed openly without embarrassment. Will God bless a nation like that? Such base sins as incest and homosexuality have been, homosexuality have been <coughs> so glamorized until men no longer feel a tinge of guilt about these sins. And satanic language is now the order of the day. And this worse than that. that, that I, I am so weary. I am so weary of hearing four letter words. Yeah, amen. And I know we all are. I'm, I'm, I'm weary. I'm talking about use F words and other words. Some can't, can't, can't care only conversation without getting in the gutter. Abortion is now such a widely accepted thing to suggest it is sinful is to become an ignoramus in the eyes of the intellectual crowd. And I, I put down a, a murder of abortion and then I tell what that will have to Disrespect for authority is the order of the day. Children come from undisciplined homes, attend undisciplined schools, and thus live undisciplined lives. Resentment against authority is characteristic of a vast segment of today's man. Don't tell me what to do, they cry. They are not accustomed to taking orders. And I really got in the deep water here. There are women in America that are so self-centered about their rights. They have forgotten that their children have rights. They have a right to a mother. They have a right to a loving mother. They have a right to a loving mother at home. And their so-called, these so-called liberated women want to put their children in daycare centers while they go into the world to have equal rights. And that's why I think the average male today is an endangered species. That is, we're looked down on. Why? Because we're not a woman. Unless you decide you are one and want to change your gender, you know. Of the sinful nation of this day, Paul said, God gave them up. It may be that the glory of God has already departed from America. And look at this last sentence I said 50 some odd years ago. We may be, well be in the declining stages of American history. And then it's the, other, the other, Ray said he's going to preach a two point sermon. So <laughs> this is a two point sermon. Actually, this would be two sermons if you want to do it. Or just one. This might be the sermon you want to preach. The glory of God can depart from the church. Now, the glory of God was in the temple. Haggai appeared near the end of Israel's captivity to stir up the people to complete the second temple. The temple Solomon had built in Jerusalem was a magnificent structure. For more than 400 years, it was a crowning glory of Mount Moriah. It was to the Jew a sculptured creed, a matchless poem frozen into gold, silver, and marble, a witness against idolatry, a hymn of praise to God, and a proof of, a proof of Israel's consecration. It was David who had first purpose to replace the tabernacle and its flapping curtains were the more permanent structure, but the actual building was left to Solomon. Seven years in the labor of 180,000 men, 83,000 men were needed to finish the task. It was raised to the ground in 586 BC by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his mighty army. Its worshipers were carried as captives into a strange land where they hanged their harps on willows and mourned in silence. Some 73 years later, the second temple was built. The latter house, and that's in the text there in Haggai, was erected in the winter time of Israel's sorrow. When the people looked on the second temple and remembered the splendor of the first temple, they wept because it was in no way comparable to the material splendor of the temple of their fathers. It had no Ark of the Covenant. 
No heavenly fire consumed their sacrifices upon the smoking altar, and no spirit of prophecy echoed down its walls and chambers. But the prophet could see with a clear eye a glory awaiting the latter house. That's in chapter 2, verse 9. Here's the glory. This house was to be visited repeatedly by the Son of God. Its halls would echo his footsteps, his walls, his teaching. He was first taken there as an infant. He appeared there again at 12. Twice he came to cleanse the temple and it might be a house of prayer. When the Jews rejected Christ and bore him away from their temple, they sound the death knell of their nation, the doom of their religion, and the end of the glory of the latter house. Soon the vultures of Rome were hovering over the land. The iron hill of the Roman soldier crushed the purple clusters of Ephraim, and the Judean hills echoed with the sound of noisy and fearsome chariots. The clarion voice of Roman trumpets startled the dwellers in the Jordan Valley. The Jews threw down their party splits. This is, uh, this is, this is what happens when people uh, have a common enemy. The Jews threw down their party splits and stood as one man against the foe. Inch by inch, the legions of Titus pushed back the desperate, God-abandoned Jews. A Roman soldier flings a torch into an open window of the temple, and soon its sacred veils and marvelous furnishings were blazing the final conflagration. And Jesus prophesied about that, did He said in Matthew 23, 37, where he wept over Jerusalem, and he would have gathered them to gather hen gathers our chickens on it, but you will not, but you would not. And so they paid the price. Someone says, well, what became of God's promise well, to them that I will set my tabernacle in the midst of them forever? Well, the temple today is the church of the living God. And there are a couple of passages there that go along with that thought. For the glory of God fill the house of God, the word of Christ must become the supreme authority of his people. Amen. If not, and there are passages about the authority of Jesus, if not, Ichabod must be written over the door for the glorious departing. Magnificent cathedrals will heaven fretting spires, windows of marvelous coloring can never replace faithfulness to his word. His spirit must animate the house or it becomes cold, empty, void of his presence. Romans 8 and 9 said, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he what? None of his. None of his. None of his. A people may wear the name of Christ, do the works of Christ, but if they're without the spirit of Christ, they're a body without the what? The, the spirit. spirit. And dead, according to James. When informed of the shattering of his fleet, uh, how you pronounce it, Traflagger, Traflagger, y'all don't know either, do you? This is what Napoleon said. He said, I can't be everywhere. That's not so with the captain of our salvation. He said, I'm with you always. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord will cause people to mind the things of the Spirit rather than the things of the flesh. And I've got passages there about the fruit of the Spirit. We must do the work of Christ if His glory is to fill the house. Jesus was a servant of the race. He went about doing good. And John 9, 4 says, I must do the works of Him that sent me. Uh, man is a worshiping creature. Man's primary to do to God is that of worship. And I'd write Matthew 4, 10. Well, I've got it. You don't have to write it. I've got it there. God is worthy of our worship of Him because of His power, knowledge, presence, and His goodness. And the wrath of God will be brought down upon the man who desecrates the worship of Jehovah. Our behavior at such an hour as, uh, uh, as this is under the scrutiny of the all-seeing eye of God. Ichabod was written over the door at Corinth because of disorder in the worship assembly. In the 11th chapter, he talks about that. And uh, when Laodicea, by indifference, had driven the Lord out, it became Ichabod. The Lord is present when His Word is obeyed, when men have the right attitude, when His people are dedicated to His work, where saints kneel in reverence and awe before the throne of God. Such a church 
will never be a church social club existing for a few years and dying the dry rot of respectability. And I've seen that happen, and some of you a little bit older have seen that happen too. It will draw men from every walk of life into its sheltering arms. Though situated in an exalted position, men will flow uphill to it. Why? There's the, its glory, the presence of the one who promised, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. That's for what it's worth to you. Amen. Amen. But I, I saw that, I thought, you know, that's, it needs a little updating here and there and everywhere and a little polishing maybe to be de decent and cutting down a whole lot. But I just really believe that it's as up to date as it can be. We know. And you might do it in a positive way instead of uh, how to keep the, the, the glory of God in the nation and how to keep the glory of God in the church today. And uh, I've learned that with sermons where it seemed like a, I had, had one of those, huh? the, the, uh, the harvest of an unevangelistic church. Well, I decided to turn around, turn that around the other way, the harvest of an evangelistic church, and that's why this little old book I've got on evangelism has got that title to it. All right, uh, somebody hand, uh, somebody hand these out. And, uh, I've got two other stacks in here, and, and let me know when it is 11:15 to 11:30, and and. Uh, <coughs> These are not in any particular order, and I'm not going to go with it. Uh, and I'm not going to read these like I did that one. I, I thought that one was lost forever. Found it down in the bottom of a pile somewhere. I, it's amazing what you can find. You go dig it in your trash, you know. Some people's trash is somebody's treasure. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12, Sam, and read it, please, Lord, please. 1 Corinthians 9, 12. 1 Corinthians 9, 12, and keep your Bible open to 1 Corinthians 9. It's in the New Testament, so. <laughs> he likes to pick on me out of the I'll pick on him a little bit. If others partake of this right over you, do not we yet more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we bear all things that we may cause no hindrance of the gospel of Christ. Okay, this is a, this is one written in the negative. Wrote it years ago. You can tell from the type that I this is, it was printed on the first printer of Rome, a matrix printer. And so that's been quite a number of years ago. So if I were writing it today, I would write it on how to keep from hindering the gospel. Okay? And there are a lot of verses there that all deal with the gospel. And you might pick out one or two of them. I, I'd pick out especially Mark 6, 15, 16, 15, go preach the gospel and Paul says, Woe to me is not to preach not the gospel in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, so on. And it was Paul's desire, his prayer, that it would never become a hindrance to the gospel. And we may not intend to, but sometimes we do that by carelessness or maybe our neglect. So how can we, and I'm going to put it in the positive rather than in the negative, how can we prevent our becoming a hindrance to the gospel? Well, we, first of all, we can tell it. The Lord meant for the gospel to be told. And that's how Paul felt about it. 
And there's this story in 2 Kings chapter 7 when the Syrians besieged the city of Samaria. And the food, their, their, their food was all gone, that is, and they were starving, that is, and besieged people. And there were four lepers thought they didn't have anything to lose. So we're just going to go to the Sears. They had plenty of food over there. We'll just go over there to their camp. And uh, say the worst thing you can do, we're going to die anyway. And the worst thing you can do is kill us. So we're going to die either way. So they went over there. But the Syrians had heard the rumbling of God. And they fled the camp. And so when the lepers got there, there was plenty of food left behind. And boy, they were, they, were, they were having that time. And one of them said, we're not doing well here. We're not doing well. This is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. And uh, I just picture those hobbling into the city, crying, there's food enough for all. Come and get it. I think there's a reason God put that in the Bible, don't you? Amen. And, it's, it, and God wants the gospel to be told. And, and we have food enough and to spare here, and God doesn't want us to keep it to ourselves. And there's, if there's ever time for the church to march, it's now. Everyone can be a soul winner in some fashion. You say, well, I just can't do that. You could hand a tract to somebody. You could mail somebody one. You could put a tract, gospel tract in your bill that you mail when you pay your, your, your light bill or some other bill that you have. Uh, you can call somebody, you can call to your neighbor. Invite them to come to worship where, where, where someone else might be able to teach them. Or... Uh, Make you a card like Don Myers that said, uh, I'm, I'm Don Myers and I, I'd like to send you a Bible correspondence course. And, and, and you have people to do that, don't you, Don? Yes, sir. And so there are, there are all kinds of ways. And, and the, the church, we, we just need to tell it. The second thing is that we, we're not hindering, we, keep from hindering the gospel, we need to live it. And many can hide the gospel by not living the gospel. But Philippians 1 27, I think, is key right there, where it says, Let your conduct be as it becomes the gospel. What does that say to y'all? What does that say to you, become the gospel? Live like Christ. Live like Christ, okay. Anybody else? What about living. It makes, it, makes it attractive. Make it attractive. Uh, <laughs> Titus it says adorn the gospel, adorn the doctrine, make the, the adorn makes it beautiful, make people want the gospel. See, people are thirsty. We need to just let them know where the water is. Amen. See, we don't need that like it's a burden. We need that like it's a joy. Need to show, brother Melvin. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, brother. We, we can't have any more. <laughs> Brother Bell, and here's your notes right here. I get it. They were giving one. I got it on my Bible, too. There. I got one. Oh, All right. Okay. okay. We've already gone over one outline, so we're, we're, we're on the second one. Okay. Okay. He's already been on that. Okay. So we, we, we do not, we're not hindering the gospel. We're promoting the gospel when we live the gospel. And, and there's, there's more to the gospel than death, burial, and resurrection. We're to live in the keeping with the high claims of the gospel, Philippians 1 to 7. And the work of Christ is being blamed, the work of the Lord being blamed by people. I heard this person say that, I heard an individual say this, and they call the individual's name, and I bet you put so and so. There are a lot of so and so's in the world. If, if they, when I see how some in the church act, I wonder why they even come to church. You see, the preacher may not know how they act, but their friends know how they act, how they talk, how they dress. How, so well, the greatest need in the church is for Christians to, is to live like Christians, just to be New Testament Christians. I prepared a sermon one time, Don, I call it, let the church be the church. Let the church be the church. We, hinder, we, can, uh, we can help promote the gospel and not hinder the gospel by giving to it. That's what Paul 
ruled by 1 Corinthians 9, 14. And it'd be a wonderful thing, I'm going to move on, because I gave you some of this on the last time, if every cr Christian would give a minimum of one-tenth of his income to God. And that's the place you start. And uh, now the Jews would, would, would start there and beyond if they, when they became Christians. And then if, if we want to, to, to not hinder the gospel, but, but help promote the gospel, we've got to defend it. Paul said, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. And, and we have to defend it against being perverted. That's what Paul talked about in Galatians 1. And he talked about a perverted gospel. And as an interesting, we're not going into it now, maybe one day we will go into the difference in uh, the Greek words there in Galatians 1, 6 through 9 for gospel, another gospel. Another of a different kind is what that means. And we need to defend it against formalism, modernism, and liberalism. And then we, we, we uh, promote the gospel when we obey it. And it's not a little thing to disobey it. Peter asked the question, what shall, be, what shall be the end of those that do not obey the gospel? And, and then Paul tells you the end of it in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. So how do you obey the gospel? Ask those in Pentecost, the Samaritans, and the eunuchs, and so forth. The next sermon is called The Voices That Call. I'm, I'm just going to hit the points. This is an old sermon a lot of preachers have preached. Hugh Fulford is a dear friend of mine, and he was advertising sermons he's going to preach in a meeting, and this is one of them. Well, uh, he didn't get it from me, and I didn't get it from him. We got it from the same source, wherever that was. But there are different calls we have coming. I use Proverbs 1 where the Lord said, Because I have called, you refused, I stretched out my hand, but no man regarded it, said it not, my counsel would not of my reproof, and so forth. So from every corner of the globe, man is being called for various causes and movements, communism. There's the occult, there's political, uh, there's the political arena. But, but, but our destiny, our de eternal destiny, depends upon our reaction to certain voices that call, the gospel call, the call of to faithfulness, the call of the world, the call of the conscience, our conscience condemns us or approves us. And these pages stuck together. Right? The call of death and the call to the judgment. That make a good little sermon to preach one Sunday night. I'm, I'm pretty passionate about the next one. The challenge of building a strong family. And, and I tell the audience I have two assumptions. And I ha I'm assuming that all of us want a strong family. I've yet to meet a person who says I'd like to have the weakest family you can possibly have. I, I'd like to have a family that is a total disaster. I think most people that are rational want strong families. And I assume they're willing to pay the price to get one. Now suppose you went into a shopping mall and they come out over a loudspeaker and they said that we're uh, America, that, uh, it's been announced from the White House that we're now under attack. And you need to, to and it's not very far away from you. You need to stay at home. But for your safety. Now, what, what would be important to you right there? You say, well, I've got to cut the grass first. <clears throat> well, I, gotta, I was supposed to run down the grocery store and get a loaf of bread. I'm going to tell you what most of us think. Where's my family? I'd be the first thing come, where's my wife? I want to be with my wife. And if my children are nearby, I want to be with them. I want to be with all my family. Oh, let's get all the family together. Get our friends together. Let's all try to get in a place to hide. Uh, we, sometimes we get caught up in urgent things. We get the important things like this multimillionaire that was going to escort his daughter down the aisle on her wedding day. And they were standing at the back of the aisle and he looked down at her and whispered, said, we haven't spent much time together, have we? He said one word, no, nope, nope. I think that whatever our homes can be is what they ought to be. You buy a new car, and suppose that you get home of that new car, you find out that somebody keyed the trunk. 
What are you going to do with that new car? I'm going to take it back. I'm going to say, I got home. Y'all didn't check this thing out good. And I did, evidently, I didn't either. I bought a car like that one time, and I carried it back. It had a scratch on the hood. It was a 1966 Ford Galaxy, midnight blue. I finally got rid of that thing, and my wife has not forgiven me yet because she left it. You know what the dealer told me? He said, Billy, for a car to be 99 and 44, 100% perfect, do you realize it could have 200 things wrong with it? I don't know about you, but I buy a new car. I don't want it to be 99 and 44, 100% perfect, do you? I want it to be everything it can be. And I believe that whatever a husband can be, it's what he ought to be, and whatever a wife can be is what she ought to be. I believe in I I believe in preventing problems. There was a little native village they built on the side of a cliff, and the natives were ever falling down and injuring themselves at the bottom of the cliff. So the town council met and they decided they'd build a fence up there to keep them from falling down. The, why didn't the world move the village? Why didn't they move the village? You see. We need to prevent problems. Doctors tell us to exercise to prevent uh, heart trouble, and then it says brush your teeth, prevent tooth decay. That's preventive, preventive method. You know about Humpty Dumpty. And he found, it was on the wall, fell down all the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put together again. Brother, it's hard to put a cracked egg back together. You, you boil one and crack the shell, and then you try to put it back together. And it's just about that difficult sometimes to put a fractured marriage back together. So strong families build strong churches. Now, I read a book by Dr. Nick Stenay, and that's not, <laughs> that's not how you spell Stenay. S-T-E-N-N-E-T. -S uh, but he used to go by Dr. Nick Stenay till he got his doctor's degree and became Dr. Stenay. He's a member of the church. <laughs> and he taught, he's taught some classes at Faulkner. You may have known him while he was up there. Probably in the Cloverdale Center. And uh, I met Dr. I met, met Nick and I was at a meeting in Tuscaloosa because he was a teacher at Ale University of Alabama. And he wrote this book on building strong families. He had six qualities. Number one, it's strong families express appreciation. And we have a tendency to gravitate toward people make us feel good. And, and uh, I don't know about you guys, but I can't take a steady di diet of negative stuff. I just can't take it. Mm -hmm. All of us have a need to be appreciated. And some think that maybe their spouse doesn't appreciate them. One man said, and I don't know, I read this in some place, it wasn't in Nick's book, that 80% of the things we say in the home need to be of a positive nature. It may be a greater percentage than that. Criticism has a way of outweighing a compliment. One man went off to speak. He came home. His wife said, how did it go? He said it was a flop. I said, how so? She said, there was this guy walked up to me and he told me his worst speech he ever heard in his life. Was anybody ever say anything else? Oh yeah, there about 15 people told me that, that they really liked it. You see, he got 15 people said it was a good speech and one man said, I don't like it. So who did he listen to? The negative. And that outweighs a compliment. And uh, I, I know a boy that, that was always getting in trouble with his family. He said, anything that happens in our family, my, they tell me I'm responsible for it. Well, we need to, Ephesians 4 and 10, 24, Hebrews, Job 4, 4, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 11, talks about how we need to, our words need to be seasoned with salt and we need to, to show appreciation for people. And there is a chart that you can find probably on the internet, 101 ways to praise a child. And I think when I've, I've delivered this, I've given that sheet out. I, I don't know that I have it anymore.
And so we need to build each other up and, and rather than tearing each other down. We've got to appreciate each other. Secondly, develop good communication patterns. One woman said that when her husband comes home, she tries to talk to him, he just puts on his hat and leaves. And one woman said her husband is a mysterious island. She said, I'm forever circling around him, never finding a place to land. <laughs> but poor communication is the greatest single factor that will weaken a family. And those who are specialists in communication say that when we talk, six messages come through. What you mean to say, what you actually say, what the person hears, what the other person thinks they hear, what the other person says about what you said, and what you think the other person said about what you said. And there are these barriers to communication, selfishness. Uh, there was a survey in the Better Homes and Gardens, and, and that survey said that immaturity and selfishness were at the top of the list as the main reason that marriages fail. Paul, uh, Dr. Paul Faulkner, when he and Carl Burkeen go around lecturing on the family, we had them over at Central many years ago, and he taught and they taught that selfishness is at the top of the list that destroys a marriage. Materialism, revealing confidences, bitterness, fault finding, teasing, silence, get people, I just won't say anything. Let's give them a silent treatment. Nagging or whining or trying, trying to assume that you know what somebody said. That is, uh, we, we need to listen more and talk less. And Billy, you need to listen to this. You need to find your own, you, what you're saying here, Billy. Listen more, talk less. Be, James 1.19 says, be what? Swift to what? Hear, slow to speak, and slow to rap. I saw a sermon entitled, Making Haste Slowly. With that text, Making Haste Slowly. So we need to learn with our, we're listening with our mouth shut is a basic communication skill that's needed. People only hear about 20% of what is said anyway. Spend time together. Now, when we talk about spending time together, uh, that it is implied in Deuteronomy 6 where Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. The word which I commanded thee to thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt talk to them when thou sittest in the house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. They shall be a boy frontless between promise between thine eyes, write them on the post of thy house and on thy gate. That implies that parents are the trainers of the moral and spiritual development of their children. And we need to teach them these principles. There's one God, to love God, the Word of God, to, to, to have God in their daily routine. And the last thing, I, I, I've said this, and posted on the, if they put it on the door of their house, What's the last thing those children are going to see? Because this is the Shema, what the Jews call the Shema. And, and the last thing they're going to see is what? When they leave home. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all their heart. When they leave home, they'll take God with them. Somebody says, well, I'll do all that when I find time. You don't find time, you make time. Might have to, I, I might have to rearrange my schedule. I, I promised Todd when he was still at home with us, that I'd take him fishing. I got a call that a dear friend of mine had died, a, a sister Lucy Ellis up at Evergreen. And she was like a mother to me when I preached up there. And they asked me if I could come and preach out here. And I said, I am so sorry, but I can't come. I never told him I was going to take my son fishing, but I did. I didn't go preach that to him because I knew the preacher there could preach it. And I, and I knew that Lucy would understand. She just, she always called me son. She'd say, son, and you just preach the word, son. And you just get in that book, preach that book, son. She was a country woman, and I loved her like my mom. Cultivate commitment. We need commitment in our country right now, in the community. You make a commitment to the bank, and you buy a car, and we, we, we need commitment in the home. Now here are things that will help produce commitment. 
respect. You know, what did Roger Danger Seal say about respect? He didn't get it. He said, I don't get no respect. Trust. I was in a meeting in uh, something that uh, Solomon didn't write, Proverbs 31. Somebody else wrote that. But in Proverbs 31, it says, it talked about the, the, the husband of a virtuous woman, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. That would be trusty wife. I was in a meeting in Missouri, and uh, uh, there was a, several people came forward the Sunday morning and were restored. And maybe somebody had had a great meeting that week. And uh, uh, there was one woman, uh, she's blonde headed, uh, probably in her maybe mid 20s, maybe she could have been close to 30 years old. And she made a confession. And when she came out the door, she wanted to talk to me. Well, the preacher's office was right there, so I asked him, can I go in there and talk to this lady? And, and uh, she wouldn't talk to me privately, and I felt a little uncomfortable going there and closing the door, but everybody was mingling in the hall out there, so I, she said, the reason I made a confession is I've been having an affair, and my husband found out. She said, I've broken it off, but my husband found out, and he doesn't trust me. He, he said he wasn't with her. I, she said, I have to prove to him I've been here today. I go to the store, I have to prove to him I've been to the store. Whatever I do, I have to prove it to him. He doesn't trust me. Uh, she said, what do I do? I said, and I, I don't know what you would have said to her. This is, what, this is just part of the moment. You know, you didn't have time to think about it. But this is what I said, but I think it worked. I said, you're going to have to conduct yourself in such way that your husband will learn that he can trust you. I went back there two years later and I'd forgotten about that incident, to tell you the truth. I didn't even thought, here comes she and her husband out the door holding hands. And I said, you know how you say, well, how are you doing? I said, well, how are you today? She said, well, Lambert, things couldn't be better. <laughs> and then it clicked up here in the big head of mine. You've got to learn to trust. And then we've got to accept. We've got to accept people the way we are. And then we need to have goals in our family. It'll be like the pilot came on and said, uh, uh, I, I want to inform you that we are off course and I have absolutely no idea where we are right now. But the good news is we're making excellent time. <laughs> no goal. And no other's going. And then we need to be understanding of one another if we're going to have this commitment. Ezekiel 3.15 says, if the prophet said, I did what? I sat where they what? They sat. He went down to the river. Chief R sat there seven days, kept his mouth shut. Seven days. That's hard for a preacher to do that. And he said, I sat where they sat. He found out what was going on in their life. And we need to do, we need to try to understand our mates. Fifth thing is dealt positive, positive with, a, with a crisis. And, and a crisis is defined, and I think Nick defined it this way, as an emotional overload or a turning point. And I just read some of these verses that, that count. And there's in Matthew chapter 14, you remember when Jesus was walking on the water? There were different kinds of crises. One is imagined. They thought Jesus was a what? Ghost. Ghost. That's imaginary. Some are real. Some crises are real. House burns down. You lose your job. You lose your life savings. That's not imaginary. It's real. And then there, there are problems of our own doing because we made some poor choices. Now you could have a fourth category. We have problems because somebody else made a poor choice. But the benefit of a crisis, it will test our faith, aid with the development of patience, help build character, we'll learn to be sympathetic. And, and there are four, these things I suggest that we do when we have a crisis, keep your eyes on the Lord, realize it's temporary, pour your heart out to God like Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, 
and don't forget the purpose of the trip in this life. And we do sometimes. And then the sixth thing that Nick said builds a strong family is you affirm religious values. Paul Faulkner said in those families that where they, the husband and the wife and the children go to Sunday school together, they attend worship together, they pray together, they read the Bible together, said in homes like that, there's one divorce in 1,100 marriages. Now, if you cut that in half, let's just assume he was wrong, half wrong, that's still way above the average in America, isn't it? So somebody says, where is the verse in the Bible that says you need to attend all the services of the church? Common sense tells you some things, doesn't it? And we ought to put Christ first in the home. And so forth. Well, let's turn on to the next one. Brother Billy. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Nick and Nancy Stenay co-authored a book with Donnie and Sherry Hill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Magnificent Marriage. Magnificent right? Marriage. Right. That's an excellent work, too. And I think it has uh, a lot of this content, or a lot of those, based on those right. six family strengths. Nick also has one on how to build strong children, and has his six things in there build strong children. <laughs> and, and... Uh, well, this is a little, I, I'm, I'm just going to go over this quickly, and I'm not going to even read the text. It's 2 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 1. And these are some, I'm just going to go over the main points. I did an alliteration here. And uh, where it's talking about the end times, the end. And uh, there's a cartoon that had the sign, the end is coming tomorrow. And on the man's back, he said, maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of people are confused about that. There'll be an end. I got the verses there. And the end, the last day is not to be confused with the last days. Glory. Time of the end is unknown in Matthew 24. God's going to talk to us about those signs next time. And uh, Peter often spoke of the end. And there are passages where he uses the word end in 1 Peter 1, uh, chapter 1, chapter 4, 2 Peter chapter 2, chapter 1 Peter 4, 17. There's some things about the end, but the documents. He talks about what the prophets said. There's the derision. Some scoff. Uh, they forgot uh, the past action of God. And, and they were scoffing them whether or not that. Uh, said, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. Where's the promise of his coming, they said. Then there's the destruction. And, and God destroyed the world. Next time he's going to destroy the world with, with a with fire. <laughs> Get it out in a minute. And with a great noise. And uh, I don't know where I got that. It's got quotes around it. I saw that. The no word noise, great noise means with like the swish of an arrow through the air, the rumbling of thunder, the crackle of a flame, scream of the last. I don't know that. I think that's a type of last as it descends. Uh, the rushing of mighty water and the hissing of a snake. The elements will be dissolved. I preached it again. I probably wouldn't even use that. Elements deserve, dissolve with fervent heat. Every atom. Every atom. And that's the basic building blocks of all material things. Will God destroy the earth? Will man destroy the earth, rather? What about global? They're predicting that we're going to destroy ourselves. But through global warming, foolishness of man. God said he'll do it. Amen. God will do it. Then there's the delay. God is timeless. Time's insignificant to him. He is tender. He's long-suffering. But there's a time coming when his patience will run out. There was on the sundial in France. It said, of all of these hours, fear but one. Of all these hours. And then there's the dedication. Seeing all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be? And I just put down all these saved people, sanctified people, secure people, sweet people, and singing people. All the same praises to God. Now, here's a, a, an outline that I didn't even remember I had. Typed up. I've got it in the margin of my Bible. And if we get time, <laughs> I've got some that's in my Bible that I ran off here. If not, I'll give them to you next time. Is the Bible as it is, sufficient for man's needs as he is. 
the late N.B. Hardeman had a sermon, and, and this is not it, but this is close to the title of a sermon he had, Is the Bible as it is adapted to man as he is? And is it? Well, we, we know 2 Timothy 3 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And here's the question. Is the Bible as it, as it is sufficient to furnish us with all we need now and in eternity? Uh, many, many people imagine it's not modern enough to equip man for the 21st century. And some people claim it doesn't have any business in the modern world. Some claim the Bible is too simplistic to help with emotional and psychological issues. And the Bible is cast aside for uh, ideas and theories, political correctness and passion notions of modern thought. Uh, and sometimes people, even maybe well-meaning people, I'm not going to say they're, they, they'll go to opinion polls to find out what they're supposed to think about certain things, religiously speaking, rather than the Bible. Now there's this attack on the sufficiency of the Bible. By sufficiency, it is meant that the Bible is an adequate guide in all matters of life and godliness. The Bible provides every truth needed for an abundant life now and eternal life in the world to come. Amen. Some assume something other than Scripture is needed to help cope in our modern world. We have books that are written on parenting success, relationship, leadership, church growth. And I've got a bunch of those kind of books. But when all is said and done, you get back to this. I, I couldn't tell you how many books over the years I, that I have bought on, on church growth and soul winning. But there's one verse in the Bible that shows it all. There are a lot of verses, but one verse I'm thinking of. Acts 6 and verse 7. And the word of the Lord increased. And what happened? And the number of disciples multiplied exceedingly. Exceedingly. In Jerusalem. The word, when the word of the Lord increases today, and I have proved, I proved that when I was in Evergreen. Once, in one year, we were going to have two gospel meetings in the building. One of them was BP Black. We had 19 responses, and about eight or nine of those were baptisms, or maybe 10. I don't remember now. And I don't remember who the other, one, the other meeting was conducted by. But then I borrowed a tent. And I, took, I would take that tent and carry it outside the town put it up. I carried Carl White and I carried it over to Repton, Alabama. Put it up down by the railroad track. <laughs> I never thought about a train coming through while I was preaching. <laughs> and just he and I put that thing up. Well, Carl was 6'6", six, six, you know, and very stout man. And, uh, and, and uh, we about had it up and the wind got a hold of it and we had to start all over again when we finally got up. And then there was a brother out about 15 miles out of Evergreen, close to Burnt Corn, Alabama, if you ever go through Burnt Corn. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, he had a store, and it's called Fair Nelson Grocery. There was a crossroads there. And, and so he let me put, and his house was across the street road from his store, so I put a tent up there. And I, I had another one somewhere else. I can't remember where it was that year. We had three tent meetings that year. Five five gospel meetings and the brethren were moaning. They said, you're a, and these were week long meetings. They were week long. And uh, they said, you're about to kill us. But you know what happened that year, Don? We had more baptisms that year than any other year that I preached there. And in five years, there were 100 baptisms. The word of, when you sow the seed, that's that's the secret. You gotta sow the seed. And then leave the rest of it up to God. Now where did I get to in all this? It is doubted the Bible is sufficient diet for the Christian. 
And so people supplement the Bible with entertainment, ideas drawn from the secular world. And now look at F on the first page. There's an increase in the notion that God speaks directly to man through strong impressions on man's mind, voices in one's head, and other far, that should be far out ways. The sufficiency of Scripture has been abandoned in marriage and the family. It was once believed the Bible's furnished what we need. Now we have new techniques, gimmicks, and opinions apart from the Word being offered as keys to those with family problems. Generations of Christians testify the Bible is sufficient to keep family and marriage together. Mar no marriage ever fails unless one or both it disobey the clear teaching of the Bible. I'll stand on that. I believe that. Your marriage is not going to fail unless one or both in that marriage disobey the Bible. And the failure of the home is not proof of the failure of the Bible, but proof of biblical illiteracy of those who say they believe the Word of God. Now in Roman numeral 2, I've got all these scriptures that claim the Bible is sufficient. I'll just read the first one. Peter said we have all things that pertain to what? Life. Life. And godliness. You don't know how to live a godly life here. You don't know how to live your life here. Number three, the sufficiency of Scripture. This will take us to the 19th Psalm. And in Psalm 19, in the first six verses, there's general revelation. That's where the psalmist focuses on the creation of God. And he says, begins by saying, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his hand in Romans 1, 20 and 21 are important passages. For the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, even as eternal power and God hits so over without excuse. We can look and know that somebody created everything. Now, it, to, to be fair about it, we have to, have to say that we could see in the universe around us and everything that there had to be some power out there to make that. Now, if we didn't have the Bible, we might think that a bunch of them did it. A bunch of powers did it. But the Bible tells us that there's one God that did it. Amen. Now, verses 7 to 14, a special revelation. And the focus is on the Bible. And verse 7 calls it the law. And it's the characteristic of the law is it's perfect and the benefit is converting the soul. And then verse 7, it all calls it the testimony. And that it's sure and it makes one wise. Verse 8 is called statutes, and they are right, and they're rejoicing in the heart. And number 8, and also the, it's God's words called the commandment. It's pure and the light in the eyes. It's called the fear and the clean and enduring forever. The judgments. His judgments are true, the righteous all gather. Here's the value of Scripture in verses 10 to 13. The Bible is more valuable than fine gold, sweeter than honey. By them thy servant is warned. There's great reward, supplies, cleansing, and keeps us from secret faults. And then verse 14 is a commitment to Scripture. Let the words of my heart and the meditations. meditations of my heart go ahead. Be acceptable in your sight. I'm reading. Oh Lord, my my strength and my redeemer. I've got that on a poster around here somewhere. I thought you'd read my poster there for a minute. <coughs> this is the only commitment that really matters. If any man speak, let him speak as our of God. Amen. We have to learn to speak the language of heaven. That's what that means. Many have lost their commit commitment to Scripture, so they chase all kinds of worldviews. Jesus understood that. He said, you do err. There were people in his day chasing the world news. You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. It is assumed man's problems cannot be solved by scripture. To the law of the testimony, if they speak according to this word, it is speak not according to the word, it's because there is no what in it. There is no light in it. The problem here is that they are not devoted to the scripture. So it is sufficient to meet every human problem of our life. Every need we have, the Bible is sufficient. That's for what it's worth. Now here's an outline that goes back a long, long time, and it's not mine. I'm going to tell you who it was. 
And when we used to have preachers' forums, when I was old, we, we started in 1982 having those, and I, I kept a lot of those outlines. As a matter of fact, I could probably have a stack of them if I were to find them all. But this one was turned in, it doesn't have his name on it, but I know where it came from, Richard Rogers. Now how I remember that, I don't know. But this is from Richard Rogers, and it's called God Takes Care of Us, and it's all based on Job chapter 5. And I'm just going to hit the main points. And in Job 5, 20 and, 20 and 22, he's teaching that God takes care of our physical needs. And then in 2021, he protects us from physical danger. In 21, God takes care when others criticize me or talk about me. He, he, he helps us to overcome world circumstances. When he says uh, 21 and 22, and, uh, and then God takes care of our domestic tranquility, uh, verse 24. And he will take care of our family, verse 25. And verse 26, he takes care of us in death. That's a, it's a good lesson that I remember. Uh, and I, If you want to know what his illustration is about the son of a Hindu priest, you call Richard who lives somewhere else and not in Brooklyn anymore. The next one is, from, is one that I, I found while I was digging, and I have no idea where this one came from. I, I, I don't think it's mine. Uh, we have found the Christ based on uh, what Andrew said in John chapter 1. But these are the points in it, and I, I think it's worth your looking at and making it yours. They have been searching. They have been searching for Jesus. So... And so we found it. There's a need for seeking Him. And the world needs Christ in Christianity. Uh, this might have been turned in since he's got something about Missouri. And you remember, what was the preacher's name? He was, was supported by Pleasant, Bell Pleasant Valley Church. He did mission work in Africa. Tyson, John Tyson. I believe this is John Tyson's sermon. And then they recognized him when they found him. Uh, it says, next day John sees uh, Jesus and said, the Lamb of God. And then they were willing to follow him. That's in verse 40. And then verse 41, they were willing to bring others to Christ. That's powerful. That is a good sermon that's worthy of redoing, making it yours and preaching I've even found one that belonged to old W.T. Allison. Y'all remember old W.T.? W.T. And, and, and Sheldon and I were with two cousins. And uh, I saw a picture of her. They were having a board meeting up at Heritage. And I told Louise, I said, look who's in that board meeting picture. And there sat old Sheldon up alongside one of the women there. This is a sermon of W.T.'s called Dealing with Depression. It's so long, I'm not going to attempt to read it to you, but I, I'm going to let you, and you can read it just probably better than I can, but it's got some good points in there about dealing with depression. Now, the next sermon I, is one that I did write called Hope for the Family. And, uh, and we need hope for the family today. I probably, over the years, have preached more sermons on the family than any other topic other than probably stewardship and salvation and evangelism. Those, those are some that I probably might have gone overboard on some of it. I don't know that you can go overboard on truth. Although I've always tried to be as balanced as possible, but I still am unbalanced. Still unbalanced. Man. The strength and health of the home ought to be a concern to the majority of Americans. And I don't know, remember where I got this, but in the poll, 59% believe the state of the family is not very strong. 79% believe the strength of the family is more important than creating a cleaner environment. 92% agree we can, uh, this, we can only go forward in this country if families, if families, and, and that should be and, not can, family values are strengthened. This is social issue number one. Ray's going to preach a whole month on the family for long. 
at a convention for the American Hospital Association, Dr. George Brothers stated that one out of six marriages are successful. So, some live in a state of misery in the home. His old man died and his wife tried to contact him through a medium and, and he appeared. And she said, is it better up there, honey? He said, it's better, but I'm not up there. <laughs> some live in a state of misery in the home. If you doubt this is true, listen to some cold, hard facts. This is in Detroit Free Press, and this was in 1981. Of course, that's been a long a while ago. But I, it may have been, this percentage may be stronger today than then. 70% of the couples surveyed said they would not marry their same mates if they had the opportunity. There was a study done by Strauss, Gales, and Steinmetz indicated about seven and a half million couples go through violent episodes each year. And then Ledred and Jackson reported in their work that 80% of the hundreds of couples that they interviewed seriously considered divorce at one time or another. Is your, and I asked the question, is your marriage sinking? About in Winter Park, Florida on Mother's Day, 1981, People, the people in the neighborhood came back from church and this one couple found their house in a sinkhole. That's pretty prevalent down in Florida, they have sinkholes. And there were six cars in that vicinity of their house that were in a sinkhole. That sinkhole was 1,000 feet wide and 125 feet deep and it was kept on widely. And of course this was, must have been a while ago because I thought this was an extravagant car, $40,000 car, $40, car was left for a tune-up, and it went in the sinkhole, and they tried to retrieve the car with a helicopter. What hope is there for the American family? There is hope when we're willing to make a commitment. And maybe we, I said, maybe we just need to take a step back and ask the question, what is a home? And, and this is how I answered that question. Marriage, number one, is the application of a golden rule to a very intimate relationship. And I think a word that will help apply that rule is not love, is ours. What do you think we're Ours. O-U-R-S. Ours. This is our house. This is our car. This is our, these are our children. This is our money. This is our vacation. This is our family. Your family becomes our family. It's ours. And that does away with the thing that destroys families is selfishness. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, marriage is the permanent union of two personalities under God's law and man's. Uh, and some think man has nothing to do with it, but you'd be living in Dover if you didn't get a license and have it done legally. A covenant is a covenant establishing a home. Marriage is more than a civil contract. There are restrictions. And a, 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 what God's joining together. Who does the joining? A, a, is, it a, is it the justice of the peace or the preacher or, the, or a judge or, or, or the Supreme Court? The President of the United States or some lawyer, what God has joined together. And, and uh, the covenant established at home is a, and there are restrictions. A woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And so we're, it's a lifetime thing. Now there, there is a, an exception to that. We'll talk about that, that maybe later. And it's the greatest of all human contracts because it originated in the mind of God. What God has joined together. God said it's not good for man to be alone. He needs a companion. And it's the greatest of all human contracts. And if you want to use the word covenant there instead of contracts, I, 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 that might be better because our national welfare depends upon it. Socrates said, by all means marry. If you get a good wife, you'll become very happy. If you get a bad one, you'll become a philosopher, both of which are good for a man. <laughs> I don't know about that. It's the greatest of all human contracts because it has eternal consequences. And, and I'm going to stand by this last statement. And I've used, I have used this in sermons for all these years. The day you marry, they determine whether you go to heaven or hell. I 
believe that. I think God has a purpose for the home, at least three, to provide companionship, propagate the race, and the prevention of sin. Keep people from committing fornication. Marriage embraces the leaving of your father and your mother to cleave to your companion because of one flesh. Some assume you can't stay married for life, but that it's an imperfect institution. I told this little story about, you know, when you're dealing with something heavy, I learned this from a preacher by the name of Stanley Schiff. And he, he used to do mission work. And he was speaking at Faulkner when I was a freshman. He spoke in chapel. And he kept everybody's attention. I noticed how he did it. He would come out with something that was so heavy and deep. And, and, and it would just put a burden on your heart. And next thing you knew, he, he did something light. And I thought, that's, a, that's, that's pretty good. And I've incorporated that in my preaching over the years. A woman's husband was missing. A friend went with her to the police station. This is how she described her husband. He's 6'4", black, wavy hair, in good shape. And they were saying, your husband's 5'4", bald and old way. She said, who wants him back? <laughs> See, some assume you can stay married for life. Some, so it's not perfect. We have to make a commitment to make marriage work in the good times and the bad. Then there's hope for the family of how open communication. And uh, this causes so many divorces. Dr. Roy Rhodes said the average couple married 10 years or more spends 37 cents minutes a week in close communication. There is a, uh, a doctor, uh, maybe I can think of her name, and she did a study of, of infants in their cribs and to see how much time fathers spent with their children, their infant children. And they had the crib wired so they could tell when daddy came back. And they found out that the average father spent 37 seconds a week, or no, a week or a day, I can't remember, I think it was a week, or maybe a day. Let's just say it's getting benefit of that, says a day. 37 seconds a day with that child. You got to spend time. And, uh, but Jesse Bernard, as a sociologist, believes open communication is all but non existent by middle age. This takes you back to the old CB radio. He, this old guy had one in his car. He drove down the road fiddling with the knobs, 10, 15 minutes, trying to get somebody to talk to. His wife said, If you're so desperate to communicate with somebody, how about I turn that thing off and talk to me? <laughs> Both have to make it work. Four times men are told to love their wives in the Bible. How many times are women told to love their husbands? One. Just one time. Women have a great need for affection and love. And fellas, it's harder for us to be tender and kind and loving than it is for the wise. Men find it hard. Some of us are like the old fellow. And a woman told me this one time, and I know you've heard others say it. She said, my husband, he never tells me. She, he was 75 when they got married. She was 50. As a matter of fact, we were in a meeting with VP Black, and I was conducting a funeral, and they came to my house. This is in Evergreen, and they wanted to get married. So while I, I'm conducting the funeral, he's married. I'm in my living room. And later on, she came to me this sometime later. She said, he told me he loved me when we got married, and I ain't heard it since. Well, and, and that's the way it is sometimes. And uh, studies show that many wives who become entangled in adultery did so at first just to have someone to talk to. I believe that. I know some cases where I think that's what exactly what happened. That, that, and I've known, of, I'm, I'm thinking the case now where the husband walked weeks at the time, leave his wife at home by herself. That's the most dangerous thing a man can do. That's dangerous. You say, well, I trust her. I trust her. You're te putting temptation in the way. She needs you. And that's what I told somebody the other day. Didn't I, Ray? Yeah. I said, 
And he's telling me what all it did for her. I said, let me tell you what she really needs. Now, that Ray was there in his office. I said, she needs who? You. You. That's the way I said, she needs you. I don't think he believed in the word. <laughs> all right. There's hope for the family when we give Christ his rightful place. Psalms 127 and 1, not talking about the church, it's talking about the home. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build. Except the Lord keep the city, the watch and wake it, but in vain. Christ is to be the foundation upon which our home is built. And the foundation is, to, is important. You remember Psalms 11 and 3? If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Some build a foundation on money, on sex, alcohol, drugs, and gambling, and you just, just keep rambling on and on. It was a shopping center built on a garbage dump. They covered it over, you know, covered it over with dirt, built, built a shopping center there. Well, when the garbage at the cave, guess what happened to the shopping center? Fell in. And if you build on garbage, you build your home on garbage, guess what's going to happen to you by marriage? Build on Christ. Build on his precepts. Here's a good three-point sermon for Ray. Build on faith in Christ in his precepts, his promises, and his presence. Most homes go on the rocks. They were never built on the rock. I used to give a premarital inventory. When I was at Central, I, and, I, and it was a good inventory. It had nine points to it. And, and uh, you could tell by looking at an inventory whether or not a couple was uh, 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 compatible. And, and they did, you can't fail it, you couldn't fail it, but, you could, but I could tell if, if she was strong on, on uh, a point and he was weak on the point, that's something I talked to him about. You've got to be together. Um, communication was one, religion is another. And, and all the years that I gave that, in, that uh, uh, inventory, I had one couple, and they're still married and years and years ago. Now they've had ups and downs. I, I, I know them too well, I know them, because they come to me when they're up, and come to me sometimes when they're down. But that's the only couple they ever gave an inventory to that said, on the inventory, without eat that you give it to him, he's over yonder taking it. You give it to her, she's over yonder taking it. They can't read off each other's sheet. <laughs> They're the only ones that ever said they give him any serious thought to their spiritual life before they got married. I think that's why they're still married, even though they've had some hard times. And I think that's so sad. I gave it to one couple, and after I gave it to them, they decided they were going to get married. Now, they did get married later on, but something triggered in that thing that caused him to back out temporarily. You still have that inventory, Brother Bill? Oh, maybe somewhere. I might, I might find it somewhere. Uh, and if, I, if, I, if, I, if I open the top drawer of my filing cabinet, guess what happens to it? It falls over. So I've got uh, one of our men is going to come up and brace it for me before I can get in my pocket. <laughs> but if I do, I'll let you know. Uh, when you have Christ in your home, there's going to be an emphasis on the spiritual, the consecrated Christian living. You see, Jesus and Mama and Daddy will say, what's top priority in your life? Is it business, sports, money, world organization? I think the saddest day in a man's life is when he lets the things of the world take priority over the things of God. And, and I have seen it so much. And, and, and if, you, any, if you preach a year, you've seen it too. If you just preach for a year, you've seen it. Uh, emphasis on Bible reading and prayer. Emphasis on reverence for God, the Lord's day, for the church. Respect might be another word for reverence there. And, and then I close out speaking to someone not saved. And so forth. Now I want you to look at the next one. He says, what in the world? That's the next one. I want you to look at it. I have a granddaughter who's now 16 years old. He's 17 her birthday. She's a beautiful child. Her name is Josie. When Josie was about eight 
years old. She wrote this. And she gave it to me. And she gave it, he says, by Josie Smith. And she got granddaddy down at the bottom. And said, uh, and it's how to have Jesus in your heart. I'm going to tell you what I did with this, fellas. I typed it on a PowerPoint one time, and I preached this on TV. I said, I've got a sermon by an eight-year-old. Number one, how to have Jesus in your heart. Be baptized. B-A-B-I-T-I-S-E-D. <laughs> baptized. Two, pray. Praise God. Sing praise. Go to the church of Christ. Tell let me, let me get other the, people. Yeah, let me get the right. I got the original right here. I can't tell you about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's the original right here. I think I'm going to pray. I, that's another thing I found when I was digging around. I didn't even know where this was anymore. Uh, tell other people about Jesus. Number six. Seven, read the Bible. Eight, have love in your heart. Nine, have faith in God. Ten, never take your eyes off of Jesus. Eleven, be kind. Twelve, treat others the way you want to be treated. Thirteen, love and obey. Fourteen, more to be saved than ask Jesus to come in your, there's more being saved than ask Jesus to come in your heart. Mm -hmm. And then she's got another thing, be baptized. <laughs> 15. Read the Bible to others. 16. Say the right word. 17. No right from wrong. 18. Be a good example. And 19. Show good in your hearts. Spread the good news. Now, that that come from a, from a child. That child is going on 17 years old now. Unless you were like one of these little ones. And let me tell you something. You don't want to talk about error around that child. Ray knows that for a fact. Yeah. Didn't she call you one day? She called me several times. She's called Ray <laughs> about things. And, and then she took notes on what Ray said and she carried it back to where she didn't think she was getting the right answers. Yeah. And, uh, and if she was a male, she'd be a preacher. That's the truth. But if she, she, she toes the line. <laughs> so I... I, I told her one day, I said, I'll make you famous, Joe. This one she gave it to. Me. She said, How you gonna do that, granddad? I said, I'm gonna put you on TV. <laughs> now I can't even read this next one at your wit's end, so just forget about it. Uh, it's, it's based on the 130 night psalm. There's three points in it as I remember. <laughs> I thought when I saw that, the way it, it was blue type. This is how to remember when you wit, wit's in. Remember that God knows you inside and out. That's in verses 1 to 4. Number 2, remember that God loves you, verses 5 through 12. And remember that God guides you, verse 16. Now you can make, a, you can make your own out of that. I, I don't know whether I've given you this one or not. Anybody remember peace of mind and a word of turmoil? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Somebody read that for us. What is it? 11.30 yet? We've got, no, got just a few minutes yet. And I'm going to turn it over to Ray and Sean. Okay. Philippians 4, be careful. Be careful. Be anxious. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. Franklin Count read it like this. Worry about no thing. Pray about everything. I like that. Worry about no thing. Pray about everything. And let your supplications be known unto God. And verse 7, the peace of God. That's what we're talking about. Peace of mind. The peace of God. Verse 9 is called the God of peace. Here he talks about the peace of God. that passes all understanding shall keep. The word keep is a military term suggesting a sentinel posted beside you to protect you. And uh, keep your heart. That's what needs to be kept. Our hearts need to be kept. We need to do some heart keeping ourselves. Keep our heart with all diligence out of it issues of life. And it helps to keep our heart when we go to God in what? 
Spirit. Pray for me. Our world is on the quest for peace of mind and happiness. And men seek it, but it eludes them. Granted, our world is not peace-oriented. We hear deals to curb nuclear weapons, beheadings, mass killings, riots in the street, and babies being slaughtered in their mother's wombs, shootings daily, rise of terrorist activity, predictions of economic collapse. How do you stay sane in a world like that? Well, you have peace of mind. Some look for it in books, some in education, sexual exploits, drugs, alcohol. And you might add to that. Uh, that's probably enough, though. Solomon went on a quest. And he is trying to found the, found, find the fountain of peace and happiness. Uh, he said he sought to find out what a man should do all the days of his life. And he thought he was looking under the sun, but he found it where? Above the sun. Above the sun with God. Uh, he tried wine, women, and song, but he, he found that was all vanity and vexation of spirit. His analysis at the end of life was to fear God, keep his commandments. And, and so there is no peace in sin. Isaiah talks about that the, that, that the wicked are like the troubled sea. The troubled sea. It's never, there's no peace in a troubled sea. It's always churning, twisting, and... and, and and it's wicked out there in a troubled sea. Sailors can be lost in a troubled sea. Lives can be lost in a troubled sea. And so wicked is like a troubled sea. And there's a, uh, uh, the one sin that's the root of so much of the turmoil is the word selfishness. And, and we mentioned that earlier. Someone defined hell like this. It's selfishness on fire. Hmm. You don't have to agree with me. And we'll, I'll still love you and hope you'll still love me. I think that's the only sin there is. Selfishness. I've challenged people to tell me another sin that's not rooted in selfishness. It's the root of all sin. I think it's the root. It's the tap root. For every sin, there's a tap root to that sin. And it goes back to being selfishness. The love of money is the root. That selfishness is the root of all evil. I do believe that. Well, where did I get to? Here lies a tap root of trouble by selfishness. Destroys homes, friendships, influence for good. It destroys your health. It destroys nations. It destroys souls. We have to stop living for ourselves. Now, Paul talked about that in Philippians 2, 1 to 5. Look at each of you, not only on the other side, also the things of who? Others. And then he talked about sin and Timothy. He said he, he's one naturally to care for your state. He said he's the only one because he said others are looking out for themselves. Looking out for number one. But Timothy will look out for you. And so many people are looking out for one. We can only find peace by centering our lives upon God. Rather than seeing ourselves as the center of the universe, we must shift our gaze to God. And I love that Psalms 42, 1 and 2. Now, I'm trying to think. That's where he says that as the deer pants after the water. Read that to him when you find it. We need that. We need, we need to be at peace with God. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my pants, my, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. My soul pants. What's a pant mean? You know what I, as a deer pants after the water. Now why, how does a deer, why is a deer panting? He's been running. <laughs> He's been running away with the dogs. Okay. And so my soul is panting for God. I, and when you, if you're panting for water, you can't get enough of it. It's just hard to get enough of it. Isn't it? And we should pant for God. It's hard to get enough of God. Amen. And with God, we can have peace in a chaotic world. Paul lived in a chaotic world. Ray, Ray if you turn to 2 Corinthians 4 there and read verse 8 down to verse 10. And... Uh, and uh, can you find Isaiah 26 and 3? 
Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 10. We are hard pressed on every side, yet <clears throat> not crushed. Whoa, hard pressed, but not what? Not crushed. All right, go ahead. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Oh, perplexed, not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Persecuted, but not forsaken. All right, go ahead. Struck down, but not destroyed. Oh, struck down, not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Paul lived in a pretty chaotic world. <laughs> And if you were to write down 2 Corinthians 11, what is it, 24 to about 28 there, uh, you might want to start reading verse 23. We're not going to do that now. Uh, that's where he talked about how he was uh, beaten with rods and shipwrecked, night and deep had been in the deep and all the different perils. But then he said, besides all this which comes upon me daily, all that daily, the care of all the churches, and when I think I've been mistreated, and I think that I'm not being treated right by the brethren, all, et cetera. And I read what Paul went through, that makes me ashamed of myself. Makes me ashamed. I've never been mistreated. Isaiah 20, 26 and 3, Kenny. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. You can have peace only by centering your life on God. Verse 4, verse 2. Go ahead. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. Oh, stand, stand on the rock. Get on the rock. Do you have peace with God? We can have. And that's the old day in the gospel. You read those verses. You'll see that's that's where it's going. You have peace with God. And, and, and Romans 5, 8, and 9 uh, says, uh, verse 8 says, uh, God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then verse 9, Ray, one of them much more passages. Ray, our theme this year is much more in 24. And, and, and Ray preached out of chapter 5 recently, and he said, Be much more than, much more than justified by his blood. We're saved from what? Wrath through him. Back in chapter 1, he talks about what, where God's wrath goes. Verse 18. And, and then he talks about the world of that time. But God, you're saved from that wrath by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Well, you obey the gospel. You got to obey the gospel. And then we have peace with our fellow man. We need to be peacemakers. Follow after things that make for peace. And, and, uh, uh, you can have peace with yourself and peace with eternity. I think Jesus gave a good invitation. A good invitation for that reason. And then, we're not going to go over all this. this I call this major and all minors. And I talked about uh, Saul was chasing David in 2 Samuel 24, 14. And, and uh, while he was chasing David, the Philistines were invading the land. And David accused him of chasing a what? A flea. And all you're doing is chasing the flea. He's out chasing David, who was a shepherd, and the king of Israel was out here. Uh, and Saul was chasing David. He was chasing the flea. Major on a minor thing. And sometimes the Pharisees would do the same thing at Matthew 23, 23, and tie their herb seeds and omit weightier matters misplaced values and uh, 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 misplaced value of the Bible sometimes there's a misplaced value of the Bible uh, the Bible is a great book sometimes we put other things ahead of the study of the Bible and and now rather than the latest home journal the U.S. News and World Report I think it'd be the television the iPad or the telephone have you, have you ever sat in a doctor's office and, and just looked at people sitting in the doctor's office. And I promise you, at least 75% of them in the office are like this. Mm -hmm. Or a family at a restaurant table. Yeah. <laughs> or a family at home. Yeah. Home alone. Wow. Home alone. 
the movie. Play it out in your family. Home alone. Preach it, right? Preach it. Preach it. That'd be a good sermon. Home alone. Here's the. Right yeah. <laughs> right in, home alone. A man comes home from work, plops down his recliner, turns on the television, puts on his slippers, and goes to sleep. He hadn't said hardly three words to his mother. And she calls him for supper. He goes in to eat his supper. Doesn't say anything then because he's eating. Then he goes back to his recliner, and they sit in there, and he might say a word or two to her, and. Then he gets up and goes to bed. She, she's as home alone as if the man was out in the garage. This place value the church. The church is a pearl of great price. And there's something wrong when we put things ahead of the Lord's business. And this was done about 40, 50 years ago, so it needs a whole lot of updating. We need to do some soul searching. And then there's a misplaced value of the soul. I challenge you to write your sermon with those points. Now this is one you ought to be able to preach blindfold. The world's greatest question. And this is just one version of this that I have preached. And uh, I don't believe I've got the whole sermon here. I don't have. I just got one page of it. So let's skip it till I can get the rest of it. Here's one on marriage, and I'm not going to go over this because my, my time is about up. I'm saving time for, for Sean and for Ray here. And uh, it's what is marriage, and, and I believe this is, did I just read this? The application of the golden rule? Yeah. But the intimate relationship? It's a, it's a little different. They make social preparation, spiritual preparation. And uh, uh, then marriage is a covenant establishment. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, some of this, I didn't, they didn't have that sermon a while ago. Uh, it is a permanent union of two personalities under God's law. The marriage pattern of oneness or togetherness was established in the first union. Together they sin, together they were punished, together they work, and together they created children. Benjamin Franklin compared a single man to the odd half of a pair of scissors. Yet how often a long fellow like a woman to the court on a bow, bending the bow, yet responding to it. And men, a man and a woman to be one because they're incomplete biologically, socially, spiritually, Bearing children and rearing children. And so, and the places God would have it is a place of companionship where man is the leader. I know that's uh, not popular. A place of unity. Uh, boy six asked his daddy, said, what is the church? His dad gives one answer and the mother gives another. And could see they go to different churches. Church like a home like that is divided in sin. It's divided in sin. Uh, A place where a mother is the queen. Uh, a place of piety, of reverence, respect. A place where love dwells, where God's word is taught. Here's one, I, I, I'm not sure that, that this is mine. It looks too neat to be mine, unless it's recent. What Christians do when things go wrong, Texas, Philippians 1. 27 to 30 talks about having conflicts, the same conflict which you see in me and hear to be in me. That's what Paul talked about. All of them have difficult times. What do we do? And notice in Roman number one that God will have problems. And, and there are some illustrations of it. When with problems result from natural circumstances, here's what we do. Forget them. As a man born blind, mighty men took Job's children. Paul stored in the flesh. And their attitude sometimes like Jonah, he pouted because people repented that and, and, and his and his vine died. And Job's attitude, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. And when uh, when problems come from other people, we should do what? Forgive them. When when problems we cause the problems ourselves, we need to face them. 
And uh, that's the best thing to do. I, I remember being taught in a psychology class, there are three things you can do when you have a problem. You can meet it head on and just go right through it. Or you can go around it, or you can retreat. And when a problem comes, I have found, although it's not pleasant, the best thing to do is to confront the problem and try to apply some conflict, if it's a conflict type, type situation, apply some conflict resolution principles. And if it's some other kind of problem, don't ignore it, try to go around it. If you do that, what's, what's, what's the problem with doing that? It's still a problem, still there. Still there. You ever had anybody's y'all's congregation get mad and bleed and go somewhere else? I guess so. <laughs> you ever had that happen on the Get mad at your place and leave and go somewhere else? Never. You know what they've done? They've gone around the problem. Why didn't they stay and say, let's sit down as bread? We are bread. I think about old brother Abraham and, and his nephew. Let there be no strife between me and you, between your brethren and my brethren. Why not? Because <coughs> we, your herdsmen, not brethren, my herdsmen and your herdsmen, because here's the reason we're brethren. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to love together and you. Try to solve it. Don't, don't run off kicking, fighting mad. I've known preachers to leave a congregation where they've been doing a good work and somebody might have criticized them for something. Brother, you're not going to live long in preaching life and get, get away with not being criticized. <laughs> Sakes of life. Sad to say we just had Sakes of life. the same thing happened to us. Sakes of life. So anyway, you just need to deal. Don't run off. Sit down and deal with it. Try to solve the problem. I remember uh, uh, I, I had a friend who has so much ability. He's deceased now. We stayed in touch till probably it was the right time he died. We stayed in touch with each other. But he got criticized where he was preaching. And so he decided he was going to quit preaching. And he got out into the business world. I'm sure he never got criticized in the business world. <laughs> So he came to see me one day. I, I, I just started preaching. I mean, I was just brand new at it. And I would had one of the men in the church to come to me, and I had used the word ignorance in the pulpit. And I said, brethren are just ignorant of the Bible. And I still stand by that. Uh, there might have been a better way to have said it. I could have said we're, we're grossly misinformed when it comes to knowledge of the Scriptures. But you're still saying they're ignorant or illiterate. Maybe I should have said illiterate. But he said to me, I, I just think you need to be careful how you say things. Well, he was like a daddy to me. And I mean, I loved him. I didn't think nothing about it. I, I, when I took it, to heart, and I thought, you know, maybe William's right, and maybe I need to soften the way I say things, because I didn't soften things back in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I did start something. Well, this guy that had quit preaching came to see me. I drove all the way from Mobile to see me. Hell and breathe. He said, how are things going now? I said, doing fine. He said, how is it with that guy that criticized you? I said, what you talking about? I forgot all about him. But you see why he was there? You know why he was there? He, did his Bible, so. he was trying to get me to do what? Quit. Quit preaching. Because I got criticized. You know why? Made him look better. He had a lot of ability. 
I mean a lot of ability. A good speaker, very polished. Probably talked to more knowledgeable man, but um, he he had a, a, a he could build a congregation, and uh, I never had appreciated that. All right, turn to oh we don't have time to turn. We'll finish this patch after lunch, and I may have mercy. I, I've got I've got more than that over here. I haven't given you. I may say over the march. <laughs> I've got four lessons on leadership I want to give you in March. And uh, Ray's going to, that's what you're going to talk about, isn't it, Ray? Yep. You're going to talk about leadership today. And I've got four PowerPoints, but I've got the outline of the PowerPoint, but I'm going to show the PowerPoints next time. If I, if I can figure all that out. Because we had other people watch, watching this, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I feel sorry for listening to me sometimes. But anyway, uh, we'll do the house on the hill when we get back. And I'm going to stop now. And uh, you need this chair. You need to. Oh, you can stay there if you want. Okay. Let's, you don't let Sean let's do his sure power do his and then we'll do yours and then we're gonna go to lunch. Okay. Sean. So I'll You're up, huh? You is you is up half. <laughs> we're gonna do a word study now. be watching when we come back after lunch we're going to have a, a we're going to do a study of Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4 or 5 it may go down through verse 5 uh, entitled a house on the hill thank you so um I don't know exactly you know I'll give this assignment I just want to apologize because I it may not be exactly what y'all expect because I'm not big on big preachy words and, and fancy things and titles, but you know, this, this is just a simple word study of really the contrast of what the Lord brought when He is called Lord and servant. Okay? And that's our example. You see, because just a real simple outline of, of the definitions of those two words. Up top, you've got curios, which is Lord. And if you look at the context, really that word doesn't always apply to Jesus. It doesn't always apply to Jesus. Lord can mean many, many things. As you can see, you know, when, when they came to Pilate in Matthew 27 and, and said, he said he was going to rise again, they called him sir. Well, that's the same word, curios. Or, or Matthew 10, when Jesus would say, a slave is never above his master. You know, that's, that's a lord, curios. A, a slave owner was called a lord. Sarah is like the, the peak kind of, you know, what our wives can look at as a submissive wife. You know, like those ladies like Mary and Naomi and Ruth and Sarah are those ladies that our wives can look at. And Sarah is the epitome of submission when she called Abraham Lord. You know, it's just like that, uh, that husband that went to his wife and said, you know, Sarah called Abraham Lord. Why don't you start calling me that? And she said, when you start acting more like Abraham, maybe I will. <laughs> well... Lord, you know, uh, uh, it's inspired scripture that if my wife wanted to call me Lord, she could. You know, she doesn't. Uh, and then 1 Corinthians 8, Paul actually uses it in terms of idols. You know, they have many lords. But if you look at the context, Lord is, you know, we don't really want to, in our culture today, we don't really want to call a whole lot of people Lord because we really want to revere that name. You know, in Luke 6 and verse 46, Jesus would say, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Master, master, sir, sir, however you want to translate it, but not do what I say because he is our master. But the point is that if, if the master owns somebody, then they can literally, they're the head and they can tell the slave anything to do, period. They're the master. And they have all authority in the situation of their ownership. But then on the other side of it, you've got the idea of a servant. You know, if you go and look at the definition of the word 
doulos is, is the, the Greek word for it. You know, I, I butcher all these Greek words, but doulos is the term for servant, which when you see the word servant, it doesn't always actually mean in our minds of a servant. You know, like the ladies in here are going to cook us lunch and they're serving us. But the word servant in the Bible actually can be translated slave. Bond servant or slave. It means that you were literally owned. You do not belong to yourself. If you remember Exodus 21, verses 5 and 6, God would make the law that a slave must serve their master for seven years. But if the master was a, a good master and the slave really liked him, what could they do? Here's my ear. Here's my ear. They will be a permanent slave. That's what we need to be to God. A permanent slave. Here and Jews call themselves our translations might say servant. Really what they're saying is I'm a slave of Jesus. He owns my entire life. And then if you remember Luke chapter 17, the apostles would come to Jesus and say, increase our faith. And Jesus would say in verse 6 of Luke 17, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll be able to move mountains. You know, and just, or you'll be able to say to that mulberry tree, be rooted up and move over. There is zero purpose to ever be able to move a mountain made out of rock. We had dynamite for that. But what Jesus is saying is that if you want to move mountains in your life or do these amazing things, you got to have faith. And then in verses 7 through 10 of Luke 17, he gives a commentary on how to do that. He says, do you suppose that a master, when his slave is outside working, tending the sheep, when the master comes home, do you suppose the master is going to say to the slave, come and eat with me? No, the slave is going to work and cook, serve the master, and then clean. And then the slave is going to go to bed saying, I'm an unprofitable servant because I've only done the things that are commanded me. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you want to be increased in your faith and you want to know how to move mountains in your life? You work your tail off and then don't get prideful about it. You, he's saying you literally become a slave, period. And then the most shocking part, you know, this is all stuff in reference to us. But the whole point is to see the contrast in Jesus being Lord, the head, the master, the one that, that's called our Savior. He has all authority and all, all power, period. Yet he also was a servant, which means what? It's not even translated that way, but that's what it means. Jesus became a slave. And the main passage is, turn to Mark chapter 10. I know that you guys can quote all this, but... We're going to read parts of it anyway. You know, Mark 10, this is the, the situation where James and John, you know, really it can be logical that James and John thought we're the best apostles. That can, that can be a logical... They probably thought that that was the logical conclusion to come to. I mean, all the other apostles are nine. You know, we're in the inner three. And not only that, Peter is a complete nincompoop. He's always speaking up. So we're probably the best apostles. So we are the ones that deserve the right hand and the left. And that's when they come to Jesus and ask Him. They probably they came to that conclusion. But verse 41 says, the ten were displeased. Well, duh. They just said that they're better than all of them. And Jesus calls them all together. Verse 42, he tells them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. You look out, and he's just naming a real-world principle. The politicians, the bosses, the CEOs, the managers, all those people are going to seek power and push other people down. And he's, James and John, that's what you guys are trying to do. But... It shall not be so with you in the kingdom of God. If you want to be great, you become a servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave, a slave of all. And then this is the example. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to be a slave. You know, and then you got two more passages down there at the bottom. John 13, 12 through 17. This is Jesus, the King of the universe, coming down and being the absolute lowest of the low and washing feet. The, the, what the lowest level slave would do. He came from the highest of heavens and came down to be the lowest of the slave. 
And he said, you know, I preached a sermon not too long ago that said there's nothing new in the New Testament. You know, if you actually go through and read all of Jesus' like for example, the Sermon on the Mount, everything that he said, that can be found in the Old Testament. That can be found, you know, you're a light to the world. That's not new. Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 4, uh, Moses would say, Deuteronomy 4, verses 6 through 9, that's what it is. Moses would say, the whole world is going to see you and be amazed at your understanding. That's a light to the world. Uh, you've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery, but don't, I say to you, don't even lust. Well, Job 31, Job made a covenant with his eyes. That was already there. You know, do good unto those that do evil to you. Proverbs 25, that was already in the Old Testament. All those things that Jesus said was already in the Old Testament. Already there. But Jesus did bring one new thing. It was in John 13. He said, you've heard that it was said, you love each other as you love yourself. But now your new command is that you love each other as I have loved you. That's the example. Philippians 2, you know, verse 5, where it says, let this mind be in you. And I never knew what that was until I read the first four verses. You know, <laughs> if any tender mercies, you know, all those things, compassion, uh, all... Let that mind be in you, because that was in Christ Jesus when he was in the highest and came down to the lowest. The point is that for the Christian, with the Lord being the head, our example, for the Christian, there's no job so low. Nothing that we shouldn't be willing to do. And at the bottom, on the back of your page, I put four sections. You know, we as men especially should see that we're supposed to be a slave in every aspect of our life. And you'll notice in all four sections I put a passage from 1 Peter. Because 1 Peter, I mean, that, that's literally a letter of submission. He says submit like 400 times, you know, because we're supposed to submit in every aspect of our life. You know, for example, our home. Every young man that I talk to wants in his mouth read that the wife submits to the husband. You hear that? You're supposed to submit to me, right? Well, there's also a submission on the man's part. I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Lead her. Cherish her. All those things. I'm a slave to my wife. I'm a slave to my wife. Before we got married, I tested her. We, every time we got together, we studied the Bible. And after six months, she bore, you're willing to put up with me for six months on studying the Bible, you're the one. And I married her. And even to this day, we study the Bible six times a week. Sometimes we get so busy that we only get down to four. But our standard is set that we study six times a week, except the only day we don't study is Sunday because we're with the brethren. But we study the Bible six times a week because I, I'm showing her I'm a slave to making sure we learn. We spend, as Brother Lambert was so eloquently putting earlier, we spend time with our families. You know, I'm not going to spend 30 se 37 seconds a day with my wife. We're going to sit down and study the Bible, and I'm still going to do all the work that I need to do. But I want to make sure I get time in with my wife. I need to show her, does, is she supposed to submit to me? Yes. But if I'm the head, this, this is the dichotomy of being the Lord and the servant, right? This was Jesus' example. He's the head and he has all authority, but he was also the lowest of the low and was willing to serve in every way. This is, if I'm the head, the Lord, the master, the king of the house, then that also means that I'm head slave. I'm head slave. And my wife needs to see that. You know, she knows that I might be gone one hour, I might be gone eight hours. I'm out visiting people in the hospital, trying to find police officers to pray with. All that, I'm, I'm out doing what I need to do, and I don't know when I'm going to be back. So I told her one day a week. I said, weekends are too crazy, but you pick one day, one of the weekdays, and that'll be what I call wife day. I'll do all your chores. You do what you pick what you want to do, and if you want me to be there, if you want me to be gone, we'll do it together. And sometimes I don't even get to do the chores because she's one of the ladies that wants to be attached to my hip. You know what I mean? Like she she picks what we do, and I the whole day is dedicated to her. Because I want to show her that I'm head slave. I need to make sure that I'm massaging my wife's feet. I'm not seasoned yet at doing her toenails, her pedicure, but I'm gonna get there. However, I'm trying to show her that I'm head slave. <laughs> And it, took, it only took about 200 times for me to massage her feet, but guess what she's done now? Massage mine. And she was gagging the whole time. She hates feet. <laughs> but she saw that I'm, her, I'm a slave. So she said, I need to follow that example. And the point is that Jesus just overflows us with love, that we need to just try to reach the point, but we never will. 
well, I need to be sure to, every time I, my wife washes my feet, I need to wash hers 10 times so that she can't reach my standard of love and my standard of slavery so that I'm being the Lord and head slave in the house. That's the two things I need to be. In the church, you know, you read Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 2, love the brethren. You know, be hospitable with one another. 1 Peter 4, 8, I'm a slave to the church. And that's a challenge sometimes because if there's a if there's 70 people, it's hard for me to dedicate so much time to each individual person. That's why I say from the pulpit, I'm going to tell you something. I, I adopted a philosophy that says my answer is always yes. Just maybe not right now. We looked at every weekend in February is taken up. Now we've got weekends in March and April and May being taken up. I mean, we are booked tight. And my answer to you, if you ever need anything, is always yes. I will always say yes. Just be patient with me. Because the Lord will never let you down, but I will. But I need to be a slave to the church. 2 Corinthians 11, 28 says, my, my deepest concern daily is for the churches. Is what Paul said. All those things that he went through. And then this is one that Titus, chapter 2, on our job. You know, we, we don't teach this enough to our young men. Titus 2 is the epitome of this example saying, teach, the younger, teach servants to be obedient to their masters. That's the employee-employer relationship. In fact, Titus, the reason I say Titus is because he says not to talk back or to be angry or, or to you be obedient to your boss. Period. You know, I worked in a pizza joint for six years, and everybody was terrible. Passing blame, passing responsibility, not doing what they wanted to do, talking about the balls behind their backs. So what was my duty? To do the complete opposite of those things. I needed to obey. If I was blamed for something that I didn't do, guess what I did? Okay. I'm sorry. And I kept trucking. And that wasn't fun. I hate being blamed. But just keep trucking. You know, First Peter 2, he would say, you guys remember this, if you do something wrong and take it patiently, there's no reward in that. But when you do good and take it patiently, that is what's commendable for God. And you know what he's talking about in that context? He's talking about our jobs. He's saying if you're in the workplace or if you have a master that is, do, be obedient to your masters even if they're evil. Don't just be obedient to the good masters. Period. You know that we're a slave. A slave's entire duty in their life is to please their master. And then finally, the government. You know, is it lawful to pay Caesar? Well, give Caesar his junk and give God his junk. That's the whole message. You know, 1 Peter 2, Romans 13 says, submit to every ordinance of man. You know, we are literally, if we're slaves, our entire life is, is submission. Our entire life is submission and, our, and all these institutions. And it's important to understand that, you know, it's a big temptation for us to, to come in here and, I mean, just really be sad about where the country's heading and where the world is heading. Well, 1 Corinthians 5, if you guys remember, you know, we always look at 1 Corinthians 5 as the withdrawal from the, from the fornicating brother. Well, verses 9 through 13 of 1 Corinthians 5, what's tucked away in there is Paul saying, I wrote to you, Corinthians, that you're not supposed to keep fellowship with somebody that's sexually immoral. But he draws a distinct line. He draws a distinct line. He says, but what I mean by that is this. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to keep fellowship with somebody that's sexually immoral who is called a what? Brother. A brother. <laughs> he said the ones that are sexually immoral, you have to go out into the world to go out and convert those people. You remember in chapter 6 when he says that these will not inherit the kingdom of God. Thieves, revilers, codomites, ped they were pedophiles. And he says, such were some of you. Homosexuals. I mean, you want to talk about people that are, that are ungodly. I mean, so what that tells me is that the church has no place. No place whatsoever for me to stand behind the pulpit and say, the country sucks and we should all criticize it. The LGBTQ community is terrible. You want to know why there's an LGBTQ community? Because they don't know Christ yet. It's because they don't know Christ yet. Period. And you understand Matthew's account of the gospel? 24 some odd times it says that Jesus served the multitudes. He fed tens of thousands of people food. He healed untold thousands of people in their illnesses. Thousands of people he taught sermons to, but then in Acts 1, how many people were there? 
In Acts 1, before the church started, how many people were there? 120. 120. Where's the multitudes? Where are they? It doesn't, because the point is this. Jesus didn't sit back and say, Israel's going down the drain. I'm so upset. No, he went out serving. He served. He was a slave to everybody. To every, that's Philippians 2. He, sub, he submitted himself. He came from the highest of heavens and came out of the lowest of the low and served everybody uncompromisingly. Statistically speaking, Jesus' ministry was a failure. Jesus' ministry was a failure, statistically speaking. If he healed and fed, let's say, 50,000 people, 120 responded. That's almost nothing. But he planted the seed. He planted the seed because he was a slave to everybody. Everybody. He, and he taught us to be a slave in our home. I need to be a slave to my wife and my kids one day. Keep on setting that standard of studying with my wife. All week, make sure we sit down and have time with the Bible together and eat together, not just on our phones, as Brother Billy said. A slave in the workplace, which is, I mean, the workplace I'm in now is evangelism, but it, we need to teach it to our kids. If they take a secular job, I'm a slave. They're your slave, son. I mean, you just got to do the best job you can. In the church, I'm a slave. Serve everybody in the church, even if they're a Judas. Jesus knew Judas had the money, but yet he still washed his feet. Even if somebody's doing something wrong, still need to serve and finally be a slave to the government. In fact, Jesus would say, you know, the Romans could require a Jew to walk a mile with their stuff. You know, we know the Jews would actually walk out of the city a mile and put a wooden post and would walk exactly one mile and drop the Roman stuff because they hated the Romans. And Jesus said, if, if you need to walk a mile, do what? Go with them too. He, he, he is setting a standard that not only, not only do you need to obey the government, but show them love and care for them. Show them love. And, and go the, that's where the term, we know that the term, go the extra mile. Care for them. Show them something different. Because my job is not just to obey the government, but to make their job easier. If a policeman tells me to do something, I just got to do it with a smile on my face and be happy. Because no matter what happens to me, it's all about eternity. Because the Lord set the example. He's the head, he's the master, but he's also head slave. So I need to be head, but that means I need to be head slave. That's all I got. Maybe. Okay, we're going to break for lunch, and after lunch, we're going to let Ray present his. Sounds good. Terrell. And uh, in the meat, before we go to lunch, David has some brochures for the uh, spiritual enrichment series. It's going to be February the 18th through the 24th, and it will be at Azalea City uh, on Schillinger Road. And uh, Ray and I would suggest that you come Monday by 9 o'clock. <laughs> and I speak at 9 on God is faithful and righteous at 9.40 on God is good. And uh, and then, uh, if, uh, do you have enough brochures for everybody? Yes, sir. Get a copy? Yes, sir. All right, very good. And... Uh, and David, let, let me, uh, well, I, I'll talk to you during lunch. Okay. We'll talk about it. Something else. Uh, anybody have an announcement that you want to make? Somebody might have to, I hope you won't leave because we're going to have spaghetti. <laughs> and if you don't like spaghetti, there's a restaurant up here on the right called the Gathering. <laughs> Help yourself. But uh, uh, I'm sure Hazel will treat us right. She always does. She's a sweet, sweet person. And Hazel used to make trips to Guyana. She's probably made over 30 trips to Guyana. But due to her age right now, she's getting close. You're getting close, I'd be on 9-0. I'm not sure what her age is now. I, I used to call her 85, but that's, that was a while back. So she, 
moving on up the ladder. Here, uh, we have a class that needs a teacher on Wednesday night. We've been announcing it for about six months. And uh, we had some fill-ins, and Hazel took it Wednesday night. I agree. And I mean, being at her age and all the things she does already, she's now teaching that class to look and find somebody more. Mm -hmm. That's the same, man. Didn't mind, but but well, she's got a servant heart. She does. Does. If you want something to look about being a servant and serving, sit down and talk to Hazel Brand for a little while. She can explain to you. But she won't tell you what she does. <laughs> she can outwork you, though. She can outwork anybody in this room, especially me. She's got a lot of energy. <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to go to lunch. I guess she's is she looking for us now. Yeah, she's ready. All right. And uh, Brother Henry Hard. We're glad you got to be here today. Oh, Brother yes. Melvin, they came in after we got started. And, and uh, hope, hope you all profit from what we're doing today. Uh, I want to go ahead and give you the, the uh, time for our meeting for March. Before I forget it, it looks like it will be the 7th of March. I'll be the first Thursday. The 7th of March? Yes. That'll be the first Thursday in March. Ray, will you be here then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, I see you're going to be out the, the next week. The next week, the uh, beginning of the 10th. And daylight savings time to you start the next week. Whatever that means. Mm -hmm. That's great. I like it when it changes. Well, uh, we'll come back in a little while. We're going to have prayer. But, Brother Henry, I'm going to get you to say the, offer thanks for the food we're going to enjoy. And let's try to get on there. And if, if we could get back in here about like a quarter to one instead of one o'clock, uh, 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 then we could get home break and have what he wants to do. And uh, I might not go quite as long today. I, I couldn't sleep last night, but my, my neuropathy was on my feet, so I got up and did a treatment. I have a little machine I put on it that does a treatment. So I got to bed about 12 o'clock. Well, I woke up at 3.30, and guess what? I hadn't been back to sleep yet. So wow. <laughs> it was a little a short night. Louie said, you gonna go to sleep while you're doing that. I said, no, no, <laughs> no, no. Not quite. I'm just not as a, well, you know how you'd feel if it's you. you. You wouldn't be quite as alert as you would like to be. But I'm probably as alert as I'll ever get. Uh, I want to ask you all to do something that, um, that when you have opportunity in your private prayers. And the, I've, I've had a trainer three days a week for several years. And first of all, I had him when I was going to the YMCA and uh, and after they sat it, they had to close it and he stopped going there and he started coming to my house three days a week. His name is Brandon Cross, a fine young man. He's not a Christian. And uh, I've, I've gotten him to come here one time to work and visit with us. Well, his wife now has stage four cancer and all of her bones in her lymph nodes and so uh, he didn't come Monday and he didn't come yesterday. And I don't know whether he can come tomorrow or not. But she had to go to the hospital, have fluid taken off. She, she had to go back right and she had to have four liters taken off her stomach, uh, four liters of fluid. So she's uh, been out to MD Anderson, scheduled to go back. Her name is Missy Cross. 
And uh, I, all I'm asking is there, I don't, I don't, I don't know. We're not doctors, so we can ask God to help her get well and help the things that doctors do. But I would like for y'all to pray that I'll be given the opportunity to share gospel with her. Amen. That's big, my biggest concern. I, it hurts my heart, and I just. It, just, it, it really, it's, it just troubles me. It troubles me. Because I've met, she's been over to our house one time. She came over, just recently, let's say she got sick. She, and uh, she's a sweet, very sweet, kind person. And, uh, but she hadn't felt like having company. And I talked about maybe Ray dropping by sometime. And, Maybe maybe he could reach her. I couldn't, you know, because Ray has experience and he's done hospice work in the past and worked as chaplain in the hospital. So he he's had training that I haven't had. Of course, I've had some training ex by experience, but uh, I'm probably a little crude when I go to do it. And I last one I baptized had stage four cancer. I told her I said Missy, and her name was Missy too. Missy Mason, and I said, and she had stage four. I said, this is not anything I can do about your body. I said, I don't, I don't, I, that's out of my control. But I said, I want to help you with your soul. And she said, well, well I, I want you to, I want that, Mr. she called me Mr. Billy. She, we met her at uh, Old Charlie. She's a waitress. And, uh, uh, she just got down, she, she had. So I went over and studied with her and she was staying in a condo, condominium that belonged to a friend of hers. He let her borrow it for a week to stay in so she could have her boys to stay with her. That's the only way they could be with their mother. And so I went over there and the room was full of people and I told her, I just had to block them out uh, that they were in there. And so I said, Missy, I said, that way don't have, I said, normally, when I stay with people, I might do it over a period of time. But I said, we don't have that, we don't have that luxury today. She said, I know it. And so we stayed about two hours and she obeyed the gospel. Amen. I'm tied in a spa that swimming beside the swimming pool. And in all my years of seeing people baptized, I don't think I've ever seen a soul as bad as happy as that woman was. And she had a burden lifted off her. And uh, we had another woman, Ray knows, near Dottie West, and Dottie had stage four cancer. She was sitting in a Bible class on a Sunday morning. So I asked her, Dottie, I said, how are you doing? She said, well, I went to the doctor this week, and he told me I had six months to live. It's just like that. And the doctor was right. She had about six months to live. And I went over to where she was staying, and when she was down, just right before she died, and I know Ray went over there too. And I told her, I said, uh, she, she, she was beginning to be not very aware, but, but she opened her eyes, and she saw me, and she saw Louise, and she ran, and wanted to hug us, and I said, well, Naughty, I said, you do know, don't you, that the best is yet to come. Amen. She said, yes, sir, Mr. Billy, I know that. And I did that. And she did that. Mm -hmm. And her sister said, hold that, I'm going to take a picture of it. <laughs> and they showed that <laughs> during her funeral. But it's hard. Uh, we've got so many people in the church here that's got cancer. One that went thought you had it, and praise the Lord, it was benign. And uh, both of my brothers had cancer. Uh, my youngest brother just got through with treatments out in uh, uh, Texas, Tyler, Texas, with uh, cancer, prostate cancer. And my brother Don has it, and he's not doing well. So it's a bad thing, I've had it, but they told me you can have radiation. 
but if it comes back, you can't have surgery. Uh, so they told me right there, they thought it might come back. I said, well, take it out then. I said, I had surgery. And I'm not going to tell you that was a piece of cake. And it's still not. It's still not a piece of cake. <clears throat> but uh, at least I get zeros every time I get checked. I get <laughs> zeros. I love zeros. You know that, what they call a PSA, mm -hmm. public service announcement. <laughs> get them <laughs> All right, let us in the prayer. Where did Henry go? I, I want you to laugh. I couldn't see it. Let us in the Thank us. Thank God for the food. Yes, all right. Well, let us pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we give thanks unto you, dear Lord. We are so thankful, Heavenly Father, for the gathering that we've had here on this day and for the examination of your word, Heavenly Father. We're so thankful for uh, Brother Billy who takes time out to share. Uh, his messages are uh, with us to encourage us, dear Lord. And, and we pray, dear Lord, that you just bless all of us in our ministries, Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, we ask you, dear Lord, to please be with us and please help us, dear Lord. And, and also, dear God, we're so thankful for the food that has been prepared. And pray that it be used for the real nourishment of our bodies, Heavenly Father. In your Son, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.